Hi everyone, this lesson is on the signs and symptoms of encephalitis or brain inflammation. If you want more information on this condition, please check out my full lesson on this topic. Before we get into the signs and symptoms, let's talk about what encephalitis is. It is a condition involving inflammation of the brain parenchyma. So the brain tissue itself becomes inflamed in this condition. So if we actually look at the word encephalitis, itis means inflammation and encephal refers to the brain. So encephalitis means brain inflammation. Now, encephalitis may be due to a variety of causes. Some of these include viruses, which are actually the most common causes of encephalitis. So viral encephalitis is the most common. And some of these viruses include herpes simplex virus, or HSV, West Nile virus, and Epstein-Barr virus. And there are many, many other viruses that can cause encephalitis. Some of these include rabies, St. Louis virus, and some other viruses like the equine viruses. Now, there are other infective organisms and other conditions that can lead to encephalitis as well. And some of these include the protozoa known as toxoplasmosis. There are metabolic conditions that can lead to encephalitis. And then there are some autoimmune conditions that can lead to encephalitis like anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis or lupus encephalitis. Now, what is the epidemiology and risk factors for getting encephalitis? So the highest incidence of encephalitis occurs in the young and old or elderly populations. So oftentimes it can be extremes of age. And there's an increased risk in patients who have immunocompromise. So in patients who have issues with their immune system functioning, they are at an increased risk for getting encephalitis or inflammation of their brain tissue. Some of these patients include HIV positive patients or AIDS patients, organ transplant patients, and other patients as well. So these patients are at an increased risk for getting infections in general, and they're also at an increased risk for getting encephalitis from infective causes. And then another risk factor for getting encephalitis is being exposed to infective vectors in endemic areas. So if you travel to a country where there are mosquitoes that carry West Nile virus or carry dengue virus, which is another cause of encephalitis. If you're in those areas, you're more likely to get infected by those viruses and get encephalitis. Now, the topic of this lesson is that encephalitis causes a particular set of signs and symptoms. We're going to talk about each of those signs and symptoms and why they occur in the next upcoming slides. So now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of encephalitis. There are going to be some prodromal signs and symptoms of encephalitis, which are signs and symptoms that occur early on in the disease process. One of them is going to be headache. So oftentimes this headache is going to be a severe headache and it may feel different than a normal headache. So the patient may have a sensation that this headache is not quite a normal headache. There's something different about it and it's oftentimes again severe. And this is due to brain inflammation and swelling. So because of this brain inflammation and swelling, there are pain receptors that become activated due to that swelling leading to a headache or a sensation of a headache. Myalgias are another prodromal symptom of encephalitis. So myalgias are muscle aches and pains. So this is another early symptom of encephalitis. And then malaise is also another early symptom of encephalitis. Malaise is a sensation of feeling generally unwell. And you can imagine that if there's an infection of brain tissue, and there's some brain swelling, you're going to feel very unwell. So again, this is due to the state of inflammation and or infection. So whatever the infective cause might be, this can also lead the patient to feeling very unwell. Now, after those prodromal symptoms, the patient becomes more acutely ill within hours to days. So those are the first symptoms, but the following symptoms are very important to recognize as well. One of those important signs of encephalitis that occurs after those prodromal signs and symptoms is fever. So oftentimes the temperature is going to be greater than 38 degrees Celsius or greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit by oral temperature recordings, but it's often even higher than this. It's often a high fever. And this fever can occur suddenly, and it's due to infection and inflammation of brain tissue. And then another very important symptom of encephalitis is altered mental status. This is going to be a very key symptom of encephalitis. So altered mental status may manifest as difficulty concentrating. So it can start off very vaguely. Patient feels a little off. They have difficulty concentrating. They have difficulty staying alert. Oftentimes they're going to have decreased alertness and decreased consciousness. And they're going to have some issue with confusion or altered sensorium. So they feel like they're just not quite aware of their surroundings. And you can imagine that the reason this happens is because the brain becomes inflamed and swelled. This is going to cause issues and reduction in cognitive ability. So this is the reason why we're going to see 
altered mental status in encephalitis. Now I have asterisks on these two signs and symptoms because these are going to be very important in recognizing encephalitis. If there's a fever, altered mental status, and a headache, and I didn't mention this before, but a headache is also important, those are going to be some classic symptoms of encephalitis. Now, because of that continuing inflammation of the brain tissue, there's going to be other cognitive disturbances that occur in encephalitis. So again, there's inflammation of the brain tissue is going to lead to a variety of cognitive disturbances that depend on what part of the brain is more inflamed. Some of these are going to include hallucinations, changes to temperament, behavior, mood. So oftentimes the patient's family is going to notice that their loved one is not quite the same. They're a very different person. So their personality can have some alterations and changes as well. The patient can be disoriented, so they may not know their name, where they are, or what the date is. And then there can be some general cognitive decline as well. And then there can be some memory deficits. And this more likely occurs in herpes simplex virus encephalitis. Herpes simplex virus likes to affect the temporal lobes and parts of the frontal lobes. So the temporal lobes are an area that's very important for memory functioning. So because herpes simplex virus affects the temporal lobes, we're going to see memory deficits, especially in herpes simplex virus encephalitis. Again, depending on the infective cause, we're going to see some slightly different clinical features. And one of them is, again, memory deficits with HSV encephalitis. Patients can become so bad and so severe that they can lead to seizures and coma. And in fact, seizures and coma are relatively common complications of encephalitis. This is due to brain swelling and increased intracranial pressure, or ICP. So you can imagine that the brain is swelling and there's no place for the brain to go. You have a solid cranium that the brain is encased in. So because of that increasing swelling of the brain, there's going to be increased intracranial pressure. This can cause a variety of issues, and some of them include seizures and coma. Focal neurological deficits can also occur in encephalitis patients. So inflamed tissue in particular regions of the brain can cause specific functional or neurological deficits. So if parts of the brain that are more inflamed include the frontal lobe, this may affect personality. If certain parts of the brain, like Broca's area or Wernicke's area, are affected, this can lead to aphasia or difficulty speaking or difficulty understanding speech. And if certain parts of the motor or sensory cortex are affected, sensation may be affected or ability to move limbs can be affected as well. So again, decreased ability to speak is one of those focal neurological deficits and being able to use a particular limb. So this focal neurological deficit can be very similar to what happens in a stroke. So focal neurological deficits are important findings in encephalitis patients as well. And then there's some other findings that can occur depending on the infective etiology. Some infective etiologies can show up on the skin. So there can be some skin manifestations. One example is vesicles in HSV encephalitis. So if there's reactivation of herpes simplex virus and retrograde transmission to the brain causing encephalitis, there may be some vesicles on the mouth or on the lips of patients that are affected. Lymphadenopathy, so swollen tender lymph nodes or enlarged spleen or splenomegaly may be found in Epstein-Barr virus encephalitis. And then there can be some other important motor features that can occur, including Parkinsonian features, so tremors and restlessness. They may be found in encephalitis caused by arboviruses like the West Nile virus. So there are many different other clinical features that can occur in encephalitis depending on the cause. Now, along with brain inflammation, there can be inflammation of the meninges or the layers that cover the brain and spinal cord. So there can be signs and symptoms of meningitis. So meningitis is inflammation of the meninges. So this can lead to other signs and symptoms that can occur with encephalitis. Sometimes there may be something we call meningoencephalitis. So there can be both encephalitis, so inflammation of the brain, but also inflammation of the meninges as well, leading to meningitis. So meningoencephalitis can occur. One of the signs and symptoms that can occur if the meninges are involved, include a stiff and painful neck. This is also known as nuchal rigidity. And what happens is there's a resistance to neck flexion. So in the patient, if you try to passively flex their neck, it becomes very, very difficult. You can imagine that in the brain, the brain is surrounded by these meninges, but the spinal cord is also surrounded by these meninges as well. And if they're inflamed, 
Any bending motion can lead to irritation of the meninges in the spinal cord, causing a lot of resistance in these patients. It may be very painful or even impossible to lower the chin to the chest. And again, this is due to inflamed meninges. The inflamed meninges can activate certain nerve fibers that can cause the sensation of a stiff and painful neck. Now, there are particular clinical signs of meningitis that I want to briefly talk about here. One of them is known as Brzezinski sign. This is where there's a passive flexion of the neck that results in involuntary flexion of hips and knees. So you can see in this image here, if you had someone laying down on the table and trying to bend or flex their neck forward to try to touch their chin to their chest, the patient would also involuntarily flex their hips and knees as well. And then the other important clinical sign is called Koenig's sign. So Koenig's sign is when a patient is lying down flat, they have their hip flexed, at a 90 degree angle and the clinician tries to extend their knees. So there is resistance when the clinician tries to extend their knees when their hips are flexed at a 90 degree angle because this can cause pressure within the spinal cord in the meninges. So this is resisted. So those are two clinical signs that can occur in meningitis that can also be found in encephalitis. So we would call this a meningoencephalitis. And some other important signs and symptoms that can occur in meningitis if the meninges are involved include nausea and vomiting. This is actually an early symptom of meningitis and it is due to inflamed and swollen meninges and increased pressure or intracranial pressure within the central nervous system. And then photophobia and possibly phonophobia can also occur. Photophobia is a sensitivity to light and phonophobia is a sensitivity to sound. More likely photophobia or sensitivity to light is more likely to occur, but phonophobia can also occur as well in some cases. And this is again caused by meningeal irritation from inflamed meninges. So those are also some very important signs and symptoms of meningitis that can occur in some patients who have encephalitis. If you want to learn more about signs and symptoms of meningitis, please check out my full lesson on that topic. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.